pumping out there, buddy. Jesus. God is so good, right? I just want to start out again, because some of you may not have been here. I made a little video clip from all the things that we've been doing. Um, and uh, yet, at the same time, um, it, it's still not over yet. We've got a big revival, miracle revival tonight to end out the month. So uh, I want you to watch this. BBS we're going to be training for, and just to reiterate that and just clarify that uh, don't need it too hot, buddy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, that training is for everyone. Okay, you don't you don't have to be a children's ministry leader. Anyone who has a heart to serve children from the 24th to the 28th of July, it'll be inside at the gymnasium at the middle school, uh, the Dinova Unified School District. <clears throat> has given us access to the middle school uh, for us to minister to the kids in our community in faith. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's really something, boy, I tell you what. So it's going to be a fun time. There's going to be lots of food. They're actually going to supply all the food for that whole time. School district. Isn't that amazing? Talk about miracles. Oh, come on now. God's good. <clears throat> all right, so let's get started here today. Before I begin preaching, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Apostle Paul. And uh, well, let me give you some facts. Paul composed 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, or Philemon, depending on where you got your teaching from, and then Hebrews. And a side note, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, or Philemon, uh, were written by Paul while incarcerated, while he was in prison. They're called the prison epistles. He was bold in his faith and his mission to spread the gospel throughout Asia and into Europe. In Acts 20:23, 20, we read that Paul was fully aware that in every city he was going to go into, the Holy Spirit had warned him that prison and hardships were facing him, yet it did not stop him. Didn't stop him. Paul has been tested beyond what most persons could endure. Uh, if you want, you can open to your, uh, your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 16. Paul had endured more things than most people could endure. <clears throat> so 2 Corinthians 11, 11, beginning with verse 16, talks about Paul's many trials. And here's what he says. Again, I say, don't think that I am a fool to talk like this. But even if you do, listen to me. As you would to a foolish person, while I also boast a little. Such boasting is not from the Lord, but I am acting like a fool. And since others boast about their human achievements, I will too. Isn't this good? Come on, I want you to picture him standing there just saying, you know, you listen to everybody else, might as well listen to me. Yeah. After all, you think you're, you're, you, are, you are so wise, but you enjoy putting up with fools. 
You put up with it uh, when someone else enslaves you, takes everything you have, takes advantage of you, takes control of everything, and slaps you in the face. I'm ashamed to say that we've been too weak to do that. <clears throat> but whatever they dare to boast about, I'm talking like a fool again. I dare to boast about it too. Are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? Well, so am I. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, and he doesn't mean getting high. <laughs> Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. That's one of my favorite ones. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray and I do not burn with anger? If I must boast, <clears throat> I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who is worthy of eternal praises, knows I am not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Arteris, or Aratos, kept guards at the city gates to catch me. I had to be lowered in a basket through a window in a city wall to escape from him. <clears throat> Believe it or not, this is an encouraging message to you. <laughs> and if that was not enough, we read in Acts 28, 1 through 6, that Paul and the company of men crash landed on the island of, of, of Melita <clears throat> while trying to be helpful, carrying a bundle of sticks to bolster the fire, a viper bit Paul's hand and it wouldn't let go. So now he's got a snake hanging off his hand. All of those around Paul expected him to die. However, he did not. He just shook it off. Yeah. Just shook it off. Okay, I think you got a good picture of this man of God, so let's begin. The verse we're going to build on today is Philippians 3, 10 and 11. I'm going to be reading from the NIV, because I like the way this translates. Philippians 3, 10 and 11. I'm going to begin preaching here. Now remember... What we just heard about this mighty man of God and all the things he endured for the cause and for the calling and for the mission on his life. And here's where the encouragement comes in. Listen to his words. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Somebody say resurrection power. Resurrection. And participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so, here it is, somehow, somebody say somehow. Somehow. Somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word that you have given me today. I pray <coughs> this is going to be an encouragement to everyone in the room. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's break this down. First, about knowing Christ. The phrase, to know Christ, resumes the thought of Philippians 3.8. Paul says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Now, Paul goes on to explain in more detail what's involved in knowing Christ. And here it is. Paul encourages us to know Christ experientially. 
You know, it's one thing to know Christ because we've read about him in this book. And that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But man, let me tell you something. Everything changes once you experience it. Right. Once you have a personal experience with Christ, everything changes. Because until this becomes real in your life, until this becomes something that you have actually experienced, it's just words. So what Paul is saying to you, you listen, just press on. Just desire to have an experience with him. That's what Paul is asking us to do. He's not thinking only of divine power that raised Christ from the dead, but the power of the resurrected Christ now operating in the believer's life. Paul writes in Romans 6, 4, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Come on, somebody. How many of you really want to live a new life? I don't know about you, but even the life that I live now, I want a better life. <laughs> I, I, and that's okay. It's okay to, to, to want more. And I'm not talking about stuff. I'm talking about a new life, a, a higher level life in the spirit. I, I want to do that. As a man of God, I, I, as a woman of God, you should all desire that. <clears throat> the resurrection power that we're going to be talking about today enables us to live that new life. So let's go to the root of the message, though. Paul uses the word somehow in Philippians 3.11. I hope you heard that word as it came out in the scripture. The word somehow in the Greek is katanteo. That word used in this statement suggests that though Paul is hopeful of experiencing the resurrection, he has some doubt about it. Now, this is Paul. This is the man I just read to you. All of these things that he has been through, the trials, he's been warned by Holy Spirit and went anyway. He didn't deter from his mission. Uh, he, he was All of these things he has stepped, he was faithful in all that he did, and yet he still had doubt. I want this to encourage you today. If, it, if Paul had doubt, anybody in here struggle with doubt every once in a while? Oh, there it goes. I, I mean, thank you for raising your hands. I thought I was the only one going to raise my hand here this morning. So let's break this all down. My first point. We begin with reading Paul's struggle with sin. Romans 7, 14 through 25. Paul's struggle with sin. Romans 7, 14 through 25. Listen to Paul's words. Some of you, I, I, you know what, I'm going to say all of you are going to be able to identify with this. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. Say, come on, say, let's say this together. The trouble is with me. For I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not uh, one doing wrong, it is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Is somebody relating to this yet? <laughs> but if I do what I don't want to do, I am really, and I, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. That's right. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. And he gives the answer. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
So you see how it is in my mind I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. I was asked by one of my Teen Challenge students the other day when I was in class, and he says, Pastor Bill, you think it's possible to live a life like Jesus, a sinless life? You know what I told him? Yeah, it's possible, but it's not probable. I was being honest, right? You know, yeah, it's possible, but not probable. Come on, because we all struggle with sin. You know, we're, we haven't received our glorified bodies yet when the, the sin nature inside of us is gone. You know, we have to understand that it is a battle that we face every morning when we wake up. It's a battle that we face, we have to deal with. So it's important for us, which brings me to my second point, to understand the battle. Now here we go. The war we wage is a flesh battle. Somebody say flesh battle. Flesh battle. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. Open up. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for this word. It's all about walking in the spirit. The flesh battle. Understanding the battle. All right, Galatians 5, 16 through 18, New King James Version. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Listen up, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. You see, if you try to live by the law, which is a bunch of rules and regulations, you will fail. But if you're led by the Spirit of God, okay, we're going to get closer to this in a little bit. you got a better chance. And so you'll be more probable to do the possible and not make it impossible. Uh, I think I did that right. So there are three lessons contained in this verse. The command, the conflict, and the caution. So let's break it down. First, the command. Paul says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you see, as believers, we need to be consciously aware of the battle and fight. We have to fight the good fight of faith and acknowledge that here it goes. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is Oh, you guys know your Bible. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Who said that, by the way? Anybody remember who said that and when it happened? It was Jesus. And you know where he said it? In the Garden of Gethsemane before he went for the crucifixion. When the disciples were supposed to, he asked them, Could you, I just need you to pray with me, okay? And he went off to pray and he heard snoring. Came over to check on the disciples, they were all asleep. He said, seriously, you couldn't for one hour just pray with me? Oh, you hey. <laughs> He's Jewish, by the way. I didn't really say that, I, I but you understand? Yeah. But that's when he just spoke it out loud. Yeah, I know your spirits. It's because he knows the hearts of men. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. We have to understand this. Jesus spoke it out loud so that we can learn from it. And we need to fight it. We need to overcome it. And here's the conflict. For the flesh lusts lust against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. You see, the soul, the mind, will, and emotions of a human being is hungry, and it is neutral. It's just hungry and wants to be fed. How many of you ever saw the movie, The Little Shop of Horrors? Right? There was this plant that was always hungry, said, feed me, Seymour, feed me. <laughs> kind of like me around this time of the day. <laughs> and I really don't care where we go as long as you take me somewhere where they're serving food. But the soul is like that, and we have two choices. Either feed it with the flesh or feed it with the spirit. You can't have a little of this and a little of that. You only get one or the other. Because they're opposed to one another. So here, think about this. Non-believers that do not have the spirit of God within are always led by the flesh. You, there might have been a time in your life, unless you were born in church, raised in church. And, come on, somebody. Maybe you 
with one that like myself. And I, I did everything according to the flesh. There was a time in my life, man, you know what? I didn't have the Spirit of God living within me. I just did whatever the heck I wanted to do. If it sounded good, I did it. If it felt good, I did it. If it tasted good, I ate it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> my buddy Yesenia is back to go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, I had no Spirit of God to give me balance. So anytime I had a decision to make, I said, well, flesh, what do you want? I said, I want that. Okay, let's go get it. That's why the world is in the chaos it's in today. Because there's so many that don't know God and they don't have the Spirit of God in their life. That's a good place to say amen. amen. So here's the caution. So that you do not do the things that you wish. Hallelujah. Come on, let's be honest today. How many of you that are saved and following Christ? You know, sometimes you just, I, I saw something at the wedding yesterday made me laugh. They started playing some good music. And man, we were talking Jesus. We were, we were talking Holy Spirit at the table. It was pretty awesome. But then that song, you know, uh, what is it? How's it go? No, 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 no. And this woman jumped up from her chair and she started doing some of this and some of this and twerking and everything else. And I'm like, whoa, that was pretty cool. <laughs> so we went from Jesus to twerking. I said, wow, that's pretty interesting, you know. Uh, but you know, see, because there are things that we really want to do, but we keep them under, under wraps, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't know if God wants me to do that. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not capping on anybody, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if pastors normally talk like that, but but there is something inside of us because we still have this sinful nature inside of us. And we see things we want to do. Our friends are going to the bar, we want to go to the bar. And we can't control ourselves. Hopefully you'll call an Uber. I think you get it right. Although we desire to obey God, if we give in to the flesh, we will not be able to complete the mission God has for us. And with all this in mind, I have some good news for you today. Somebody say, good news. Good. We have everything we need. We have everything we need. God is a good God. He has given us everything we need. We have everything we need to live a life that pleases God. It was all given to us by God's own power. When we learned, we had, when we learned that he had invited us to share in his wonder, wonderful goodness. I, I'm getting tongue-tied here. Philippians 4.13, it's on my cross around my neck. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. And Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. This word of truth right here, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Hear me today. If you are born again, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And having the Holy Spirit includes with it the seven spirits of God. That was a good place for an amen. <laughs> They're found in Isaiah 11, by the way, 11 verse 2. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You see, the spirit of the Lord is the foundation, and it ends with the fear of the Lord. And Proverbs 9, 10 reminds us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding that deserves an amen. amen. And having the Holy Spirit reside in us, we have full access to the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Here they go. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gift of healing, 
miracles, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits or discerning of, speaking in tongues, interpretation of, in tongues. I like what Paul writes in Romans, in Romans 12, 6 through 8, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. I'm going to say that again. Let us use them. Amen. You guys that have been touched by God and born again, and those of you who haven't, I'm going to give you an opportunity here in a little bit. That was a good place for an amen. Thank you. you. Still with me? Why aren't we using them? Why the world's in shape? I said this right from the beginning when we were in worship. You don't want God to come down and, and, and judge. He's saying to us as a church, rise up, use these things I've given you, and change the culture. Save the children. Save your family. Nehemiah 4.14. Fight. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And I tell you today to press on. Again, Paul. Philippians 3. Moving up to verse 23, 23 and 25. Pressing toward the goal. Paul just, he openly admits it. Come on guys, you, I wanna encourage you with this. Not all of you are gonna achieve everything. Some of you are gonna stumble and fall miserably. You're gonna, you're gonna wind up with bruised faces. Cause you'll fall so fast, you won't have time to put your hands up. Press on. Get up. Start over. Paul says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. Come on, somebody. In Christ Jesus. So as I begin to wrap this thing up. You see, we don't follow Paul. We follow Christ. However, we can follow Paul's example. We can learn from him. We can see this mighty man of God who was in the flesh. He was human just like you and me. With a calling on his life. Baptized. Born again. On a mission for God. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, Paul encourages us to imitate him as he attempts to imitate Christ. On that lone road with yourself and Jesus, who do we follow? I don't know how to follow Christ. Well, for now, uh, look to somebody who's who's got it all together, who seems to have it all together. Someone who is who is spiritually mature and just you know put yourself alongside, him, jump in his pocket or her pocket, and start walking alongside of them and saying, "I don't know what I'm doing. I am totally lost." And if they're honest, they'll say, "Well, so am I. Let's let's go for a walk." <laughs> it's a journey folks and it's exciting and along the way God reveals himself so you get to experientially experience Christ you'll begin to see miracles you'll declare a thing and it shall happen so here's what I want to do today I'm going to set up three areas in the spirit today up here at the altar The first group, they're mine. <laughs> Anyone that's here today, you have not asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. 
and you say, you know what, I, I heard you, Pastor Bill, I, I want to live a new life. I want you to pray for me. I want to take a shot at this. I, I don't fully understand it, but I, I want to take a shot. I want a new life. I want you to come down here when I call and stand right there because I want to pray with you. Now, second group in the middle is where my prayer warriors are going to come in. Maybe you've been walking a walk, but you know you've been slipping and sliding, like that song, Slip Sliding Away. And, and you just want a little more confidence. You just want prayer, strength, and understanding. I want this group to come here, and I want my prayer warriors here. Now, this group will be here. This, this group over here I've reserved for the Callahan family. This group here, the Callahans, I want you here for impartation. When I shared before about these gifts that have been given to us according to the measure of our faith, those of you who Recognize that you have gifts, but you know what? You haven't used them. Maybe you're not sure how to even get that engine going. Callahan's are going to impart, impart those gifts, set you on a path, and have a discussion with them. And, and maybe there's a certain gift that's on your heart that you really want to operate in, whether it's healing, miracles, discerning of spirits, whatever it is. And let's begin to impart that. They're going to take care of that. Amen? Honey, you're going to help you in this one. All right, so here we go. Let's, uh, let's do this together for those who may be here with us today that have not yet asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior. Everybody bow your heads. You know, all of us need to pray this prayer anyway, right? My wife said it earlier. We're saints, but some, we're saints that sin. Come on, you know, some people, some Christians get upset with that. No, I'm not, I'm a saint. You're a saint that sins, come on. Let's get honest here today. So we all really need to pray this prayer. So pray this out loud with me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I'm, a sinner. I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I've sinned. Forgive my sin. Forgive my sin. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I believe you died for my sins. And I believe you rose again. So I'll say again, forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. And be my Savior. I ask this all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Here we go. I'm coming back.